us out. So Father, we say thank you tonight. God, we just say thank you tonight. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. We're grateful. Father, we thank you for this time of intimacy with you. God, we just don't want to know about you, God. We want to know you. We want to know the God of the Bible. We want to know the God that comes and breathes upon us afresh. We want to know the God that gives us peace and comfort. God, we honor you tonight. We bless your holy and majestic name. Father, our ears are open to hear your voice tonight. And our mouths are open, oh God, to worship you because you alone are so worthy. So, Father, we bless you in this atmosphere where you are God. And right now we know that you're moving by your presence. So, God, we honor you. We bless you. Come on, let's just say thank you, Lord. Behold! 
great I am. Is he your great I am? Y'all sound like y'all second guessing. Is he your great I am? Come on, will you just lift your hands where you are? Father, we thank you for your presence in this place. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness to meet us wherever we are gathered. In your name, you're there. Thank you that you honor your promises. Thank you that you honor your word. Thank you that you send your word out to the places that we are. And then in your promise of intimacy, you honor that word, you enforce that word. And in the manifestation of that word, you bring us closer and closer and closer to you. You bring us more and more into the full measure of the knowledge of who you are. God, thank you. You are awesome. The way that you operate is awesome. The way that you love us, the way that you work with your children, the way you initiate intimacy with us and then respond to our intimacy with you. Father, thank you. There's nobody like you. Father, we'll declare it until we leave this planet. You alone are God and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, why don't you give him a praise? Hallelujah. Well, you may have noticed that the altar is set up just a little bit different tonight. It's just a little bit more intimate, just a little bit more cozy, just a little bit more family-like in Jesus' name. It looks good, doesn't it? Come on, will you give Minister Johnny and the creative team a hand? They did a good job. Amen. If you thought it was a little extra toasty in here, it's because we got the fire going in the fireplace. It makes it feel toastier in here, though, doesn't it? Amen. Listen, tonight's a little different, and I, I, I just, you know, the Bible says that you ought to confess your faults one to another so that you might be healed. So let me just... Let me confess that I, I, I came with, you know, a message title and a message theme and, you know, a way that I thought it was going to go. And, you know, while we were in, in worship, the Lord was kind of like, eh, let's tweak that just a little, just a smidge. I don't know, if we'd, have, if we'd have kept worshiping another 20 minutes, I'd have had a 45 minute message down there. But praise the Lord. Here's what I want to do. Tonight, we're going to talk about intimacy and thanksgiving. Come on, say that with me. Intimacy and thanksgiving. So here's the thing. You can't have one without the other. Because usually when you're, when you're expressing thanksgiving, 
you're expressing thanksgiving to someone that you've had an interaction with. There's been some form of intimacy there. And you certainly cannot experience intimacy and not be thankful for that on, on whatever level that intimacy comes for you, whether it's family, friends, spouse, children, loved ones, whatever it is. So tonight we're gonna to talk a little bit about intimacy and thanksgiving. And we've been looking at our definition of intimacy and I'll go over it a few, in a few minutes, but one of the things it talked about was sharing one life. So tonight we're gonna share a little bit of somebody else's life in Jesus' name. Y'all willing to do that? Amen. I want to welcome uh, my brother Jerome Espy. Will you come up here and join me please? Amen. We certainly want to honor his wife, my sister Muriel Espy. Thank you for sharing him with us tonight. <laughs> You'll join me up here, sir. Yes, sir. Hallelujah. We're going to... Okay, so here, here's what I wanted to confess about. I, I wanted, and we talked about it this afternoon, and I was sharing with Minister Johnny and Pastor Javon. I said, you know, I said, everybody knows what a traditional Thanksgiving looks like. Everybody knows the normal idea of sitting around the table with the family and, you know, sharing a traditional Thanksgiving meal. But everybody's Thanksgiving doesn't go that way. That's not what Thanksgiving looks like for everybody every year. So tonight I wanted to talk about non-traditional Thanksgivings and what it looked like when you weren't necessarily sitting around a big table with your family. That's where the Holy Ghost kind of spanked me a little bit, but we'll get into that in a little bit. We're going to start by having my brother share his testimony with us. Amen. You can go ahead and grab that. Praise God. How about I turn it on? Huh? Praise God. Good evening, DWO. Praise God. Well, I was so honored to be asked by Minister Milton to uh, come and share a little bit of my testimony. And uh, this has been, I've been on a, a journey for almost four years now. And uh, I call it a journey because I know God is taking me through something to take me to something. And so this is not a destination, but God is taking me somewhere. And so I'm in the middle of a process. So I want to really quickly kind of give you an idea. So I'm, I'm on dialysis, kidney dialysis. And so I dialyze every day. Every night, it's really kind of getting close to my bedtime actually right now. But you know, around eight o'clock, 8.30, every night I connect up to a machine. And our kidneys, I don't know how much you know about the operation of your kidneys, but your kidneys filter your blood they filter out the impurities in your body. They also regulate the fluid in your body and the, the fluid that you drink, and they do a lot. And so for me, for most of you all sitting out here for Minister Milton, your kidneys probably operate 75 or 80%. You know, if you're a little bit older, your, your kidney function goes down a little bit. Mine right now operate at 8%. I didn't say 80, I said 8%. And so the work of this machine that I hook myself up to every day is doing the work of what my normal kidneys would do. So I say that to give you an idea of something that I'm gonna talk about as far as this part of my testimony. So a part of me doing this dialysis every night is there's three stages to this process. And you'll get when I'm, why I'm saying this once I get into it. The first part of when I hook up to this machine is called draining. So every day I walk around with about a thousand milliliters or so of fluid in my body. So the first part of this process is to drain out the fluid. So all day long, this fluid is taking out the impurities of my body, doing the work of the kidney. 
The second part of this process is called to fill. It's to fill up. And so it puts in new, new fluid. So over the night, there are four cycles. Each one is about an hour and a half. Drain and fill, drain and fill, drain and fill, drain and fill. And so that filling part is putting in the new. It's putting in something that can help my body to continue to sustain to where it's supposed to be. The third part of that, remember I talked about there's three parts. There's drain, fill, and then the third part is, it's literally on the machine, it says dwell. It talks about dwelling. So I go through this, and so as I began this process, starting the dialysis was a, quite a challenge for me. Uh, physically, mentally, having to go through all of that. But in the middle of it, about, about a year and a half into it, Mary, about a, year, about a year and a half into it, I was going through the process and God stopped me. And God said, you're looking at this thing all wrong. Again, he told me, number one, that I'm taking you through something to take you to do something. And then the second part of it was, I want you to look at the three stages of this thing in a different way. The draining part. Think of it like God wants us to think about our lives. So in 1 Peter 5, God talks about casting all of our carrots on him because he cares for us. And so when I hook up into the machine, Part of what I do is I put on praise music. You know, I'm listening to my favorite song. My favorite song right now is based on Psalms 119, 17. And if, you, if you're familiar with that scripture, it says, I will live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. So every night when I hook up, that's the, one of the first things that I play. And in the morning when I get up, I play that song. And I'm singing that song when I'm driving the car. I will live and not die. And so you hook up, I'm hooking up to that machine and I'm draining out. And God said, okay, cast all your cares upon me because I care for you. And so that put a new process in my mind. Okay, God, okay, so you're trying to teach me something here. And then he said, okay, fill up. You're filling up. And so he said, what I want you to do is fill up on the word, fill up on who I have said you are. Fill up on where I'm going to be taking you. And so he gave me for that the Ephesians, Ephesians, uh, Ephesians 3, actually. And it says, fill, in part, it says, fill to be filled up with the Lord, to fill up. And so we are filling up with the word. We're filling up with his presence. And we talk about the intimacy of God and what you're talking about in the scriptures that you've been looking at in Psalms 139, that God wants us to fill up and to be filled with his presence. And then the third part of that is that dwell. And so all throughout our days, we're supposed to be dwelling in the presence of the Lord. Everywhere that we go, we're not supposed to be just walking around doing X, Y, and Z. We're supposed to be dwelling in his presence. We're supposed to be, and Pastor Milton talked about this, intimate. We're supposed to be intimate with the Father. And so those three stages really shifted my mind about going through dialysis. I've, I've lost friends in the middle of this process. I've lost uh, mentors. I've had some people that, I'm, that mentor me around the country, and they would encourage me, and, and they would call me, and then I'd get a call, and they'd say, well, you know, so-and-so, he passed away. But what Muriel said, and, and thank God for a praying wife. Thank God for a praying wife. But, you know, Muriel is always good about making sure, even in the process that I'm continuing to go through, Muriel is always about, that has nothing to do with you. That has nothing to do with the promise that God has given to you. And so we stay in the middle of the word. We stay in the middle of his presence. We make sure that we're doing what we're supposed to do. So I don't know if you want me to talk about that. Okay. So, uh, so that's really a part that, you know, there's just the dialysis process. But I want to give God glory for what's going to happen on, well, it's tentatively happening, tentatively scheduled right now on December 7th. So on December 7th, I'm going to be getting a brand new kidney. But that's only a part of the testimony. That's only a part of the testimony. On March 10th, um, part of, you know, when you go through dialysis, you have ups and downs. You have days where you feel, you feel good. I won't say good. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to lie and say that. But you feel okay. 
And then you have days when you have some serious challenges. So on March 10th, we were scheduled to go to a birthday party. And I was, I, we had planned, we had planned for a little while to go to the birthday party. Mira and I said, okay, we're gonna go. But I had had a, uh, a, a really rough day. Now, even before, before I started dialysis, I would have days where I would sleep eight hours, I would get up and go back to bed. So I was, you know, I would take naps. Naps are not just for babies anymore, praise God. I take naps, I take naps now. But I would get up and take naps. I, would, I was asleep more than I was awake. And that was one of the indicators that I knew that I needed to, to go on dialysis. But uh, so on March 10th, uh, I wasn't feeling particularly well. I wasn't feeling good at all. And I kind I didn't really tell Muriel, because she we had made this commitment, we were gonna go to this birthday party, and she said we should go, babe, because we, we kind of made this commitment. And I pushed through because I really did not want to go. So I went to this birthday party. It was a birthday party of uh, uh, Pastor Tyrone, actually. He, was, he used to be here, Tyrone Frazier. So we're, we go to this birthday party. We're the first ones there. And uh, we go to this, or Pastor Tyrone said, okay, this is a table. This is the table you're supposed to go to. So Muriel and I go and we sit down at this table. And then people began to come in and about 15, 20 minutes later, a brother comes in, and another brother come in. It was Clyde Montgomery and Tiger Whitehead. I don't know if you, I'm sure you may remember their names. But they came in, and they, they sat at our table. And so again, remember, I'm not really feeling that well, so I begin to tell, tell them, you know, they, Tiger asked, like, hey, so, uh, so what, how you been? Because the other thing is, is Tiger was my uh, circle of strength leader when I first came to DW. And so we had a connection, but we had lost, we had lost connection. We hadn't really connected, we hadn't talked. And so by the glory of God, I won't say by coincidence or by luck, but by the glory of God, we were sat at the same table on March 10th. So Tiger came down and he, he, he started talking about, you know, what was going on in his life, told him what was going on in mine. And then we began to talk about what was happening with my body as far as dialysis is concerned. And I was, I was on the on the kidney transplant list. I had actually been kicked off of one because I had lost, I, my weight was up and down, but then I got back on the list, but now I was waiting for a kidney. And so being the man of God that he is, without hesitation, he said, if I'm a match, I'd give you a kidney. Without hesitation, that's what he said. So Muriel and I were blown away to say the least. On the outside, we were like, well, praise God. On the inside, like, yes, praise God, you know, but anyway. But, but I mean, but God was really doing something phenomenal. So what, what happened on that day, March 10th, is a process. You know, it takes about four to five months to find out if you're actually going to be a match. But to Tiger's word, and God bless Tiger Whitehead and his family, but Tiger went and that next Monday, he made the call and he called and he got, got tested for blood. Then he went and got tested for, uh, for a tissue match. Then he got, the one, one of the good things about going to be a match, and I encourage everyone to, to, to be a donor, to contact Gift of Life and be a, be a donor, sign up to be a donor because you can, each one of you can save eight lives immediately. You don't have to, died to save a life. You can say you can do a lot to save a life. But Tiger went and he made that commitment. Uh, he made that, that call. He went through the process. And so we, we continued to go through that process. He was going through his process. I was going through mine. My process was what had become the new, more normal for me of dialysis, of getting up, taking my naps in the day, and then hooking up for dialysis every night. And then on August 8th, and I, I remember that because it's my, my niece's birthday, but on August 8th, Tiger gave me a call and said, hey, it was a, it was a morning, um, and he just gave me a call and he said, hey, Jay, we're all go. And so they had called him and told him that you're a match. It's actually a match even more so. It's almost like we're related. <laughs> It's almost like we're related. 
So when I talk about what God has done and what I'm thankful for, you know, it's not, it's not a coincidence. When I get a chance to tell this, you know, this, what has God has done, you know, we were on Channel 7 a few weeks ago, and I thought they were going to take out the part where it's both Tiger and I, because every other word of our mouths, well, you know, well, God did this, and God was doing this, and God brought us together, and God brought us together on March 10th, and God did this. But we said God so much, they couldn't cut it out. <laughs> they, they couldn't cut it out. But I, I say that to say because we're, 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 we're standing, we're walking, and we're walking in his presence. We're draining out what is bad in our lives during each day. We're filling up with the word of God, and we're dwelling in his presence because that's who God is in our lives. So we're walking out this thing, and we still have a ways to go, you know, until till, uh, December 7th. But we know that God is on the throne. There is no coincidence in God. If God needs to get something to you, he can get it to you no matter what. So I want to be a testament to that, that even being kicked off of the list, and I didn't get the calls. A lot of people are on the list and they get, they'll get calls from, you know, they'll get calls about possible kidney matches. Okay, this kidney is this and this, and you have a possibility of this kidney, but, and then we even got, actually that day, or that we, the day before this, this uh, dinner we went to, they had contacted us and said, well, hey, you know, Jerome, what you can do is you can open up your possibilities and be considered for other kidneys, kidneys from, from prisoners and people that have AIDS, and people that have, have hepatitis C and that kind of thing. And, you know, both Muriel and I said, I don't think that's in God's plan for us. You know, that may be for you, but that's not it for us. And so we didn't get any calls about any matches, but God made a call for a match on our behalf. So there, there's a lot to this testimony, but, but that, those are the three things that I would really want to stress on, that God wants us to drain out all those things that maybe you had a year that was very difficult, very challenging, and things have happened to you. And we've all actually had a lot of things that have happened to us as a church and, and just going through stuff. And then we, God wants us to fill up he wants us to fill up during this Thanksgiving season. He wants us to fill up with thanksgiving, gratitude, be appreciative of who he is. And then he wants us to dwell in his presence for as long as we possibly can. Goodness. Woo, that'll preach all by itself, won't it? <laughs> Hallelujah. There are some things that he said that were absolutely amazing to me because, you know, I could just see God lining up and, and understand even more how come he said tonight, nope, we're not going that way. We're going to swing it this way just a little bit. What he experienced was the match that he had with Brother Tiger Whitehead was even was as close or better than a match that he would have had if he had actually been related to somebody. So here's a scripture I wanted to use tonight. It was 1 Thessalonians 5 and 18, and it simply reads like this, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And that's, that's the scripture that I was gonna bring because it talks about giving thanks. And when I was looking at that, the Holy Ghost said, why don't you go back up a little further and let's, let's take a broader look at it. So I'm going to go back up to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11, and I'll read down through verses 18. I know it's not up there. I'll read it to you. It says, wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as ye also do. And this is Paul. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none ren render evil for evil unto any man, 
but ever follow that which is good both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing. And then verse 18 says, in everything give thanks. Now there's a colon there before it finishes. If you understand grammar, a colon means because of everything before the colon, what's after the colon is qualified. So in this case, what's after the colon is, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Everything I told you above and I admonished you to give thanks, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus concerning you. <clears throat> this is simply what the Lord showed me. Everything in 1 Thessalonians from 5, from verse 11 down to verse 17, that's a picture of intimacy. It's you admonishing one another. It's you comforting one another. It's you edifying one another. It's knowing the people that you labor with, allowing them to know you. It's esteeming them, accepting esteem from them. It's a picture of connection. It's a picture of intimacy. And he says, when you, when you build this kind of intimacy in verse 18, you can give thanks for that kind of intimacy because that kind of intimacy is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So I wanted to come and talk about how people deal with situations where they have non-traditional Thanksgiving, where they're not around family members, where they're not surrounded by people who are relatives. And this is kind of what the Lord checked me about and even in his testimony, I heard it. God says this, I set people in families as it chooses me. We don't always get to pick our family. Family does not always meet the world's traditional definition of what family is. So what is family? Family is where you establish intimacy. Whether it's people you work with, whether it's people you go to church with, whether it's people you run into again after months of not having seen each other, God sets people in families. He establishes intimacy and in intimacy, we can give thanks for that. He mentioned Psalms 139. We've been using Psalms 139 verses 1 through 18 as a part of our uh, meditation through this consecration time frame. I'm just going to read quickly verses 15 and 16 because this blessed me when I heard his story. <clears throat> it says, my substance was not hid from thee. This is David talking to God. My substance was not hid from thee. What I'm made out of, my parts were not hid from you. When I was made in secret and curiously put together in the lowest parts of the earth, God, your eyes saw all of this. You saw my organs, you saw my members, and you wrote them in a book even before they were in creation. And as you fashioned me, you saw what I was to be. It blessed me because God knew his kidney. Before his kidney ever came to be, God knew his kidney. God knew how his kidney was fashioned and how his kidney was formed. Now watch this. Not only did God bring to him because God knew him so intimately, bring him the kidney of somebody who could not have been a better match if they had been a relative but because he was not just a brother, but a brother, a brother in Christ. This is the detail that God saw to. 
God brought him a kidney that was used to worship. God brought him a kidney that was used to prayer. They offered him the opportunity to take a kidney that might be HIV infected, that might be hepatitis C infected, that might have come from somebody with who knows what kind of lifestyle. But God brought him a kidney that came from a believer. It was a kidney that he didn't have to worry about drinking, he didn't have to worry about drugs, no HIV, no hepatitis C. God brought him a kidney that was accustomed to being in the presence of the Lord. Yeah. That's the kind of intimate he is with us. That's the kind of knows us daddy is all about. So I wanna encourage you, regardless of what your situation is, maybe your family this year around Thanksgiving time doesn't look like what the world says families ought to look like. I want to remind you of two things. I want to remind you that you are not governed by the standard of the world. You are in it, but not of it. And the standard that you are governed by says that God connects you with the people that he considers to be your family. And he connects you with those people because if you're sharing one life with him, then you're sharing the opportunity to connect with them in a way that they might not have an opportunity to connect with him otherwise. So let's be thankful. Let's be intimate. And let's come back on Sunday and have some good church. Can we do that? <laughs> Amen. Can we give Brother Espy one more hand for sharing your testimony tonight? Thank you. Sister Espy for bringing him out. Thank you so much, Muriel. Amen. Amen. He deserves a standing up. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you both. Listen, I want to say thank you to all of you for coming out and joining us tonight. You know, it was a little bit relaxed, but do you feel like you got the word anyway? Do you feel like it was impactful to you? Amen. I know I certainly am leaving encouraged tonight. We got some extra turkeys left. We gave away some on Sunday. We had a bunch that we had um, on a list and we were able to give, give them all away. We had some pop-ups on Sunday, God blessed, and we were able to give those away as well. Maybe something you heard tonight made you decide that you're gonna go ahead and connect with the family member that you haven't seen in a while or invite some people over that you would not invite it, you know, otherwise, and you need an extra turkey or maybe you just need a turkey this year. We got some extra turkeys over in the, in the chapel tonight. So if you need one, come on over. We'll give them out until they're gone. Amen? Amen. We love you so much. Will you come on and stand? Amen. Did the worship team do an awesome job tonight? Amen. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. Come on. Will you just extend your hands? Father, we bless you. We bless you, Lord God. We thank you for intimacy, God. Thank you for family, Lord God. Thank you that even in this season, you're tweaking our perspective. You're tweaking the way we see things. You're tweaking the way we operate, Lord God. Thank you. Thank you for the increased intimacy, Father. Thank you that as the days go forward, Lord God, you're walking us right into further revelation, Father, about where we need to be, what we need to be doing, and how we need to be operating in you in this season. God, thank you. We thank you that even as we leave this place tonight, Lord God, that we never, ever leave your presence. God, thank you that your eyes are on us. Your ears, Lord God, are open to our cries and your hand is at work in our affairs. Thank you for kingdom manifestation in our lives in Jesus' name. Father, thank you that as we share Thanksgiving Day, Lord God, with those that you set around us. Thank you that our ears are open and our hearts, Lord God, are receptive to speak a word of encouragement, to speak a word of thanks, Lord God, to remind them, Lord God, that they also, regardless of circumstances, they have something to be thankful for. Father, thank you that you use us. 
and that you expand the kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Make sure you hug somebody before you go home tonight. In Jesus' name, we love you and we'll see you on Sunday. Nobody like you, Lord. Nobody like you, Lord.